Aurora, Proserpine, Spring Water, and the Nymphs. The Corinthian order will be found to have peculiar significance, because these are delicate divinities and so its rather slender outlines, its flowers, leaves, and ornamental volutes will lend propriety where it is due. The construction of temples of the Ionic order to Juno, Diana, Father Bacchus, and the other gods of that kind, will be in keeping with the middle position which they hold. For the building of such will be an appropriate combination of the severity of the Doric and the delicacy of the Corinthian. In describing the societies of Ionian artificers, Joseph da Costa declares the Dionysiac rites to have been founded upon the science of astronomy, which by the initiates of this order was correlated to the builder's art. In various documents dealing with the origin of architecture are found hints to the effect that the great buildings erected by these initiated craftsmen were based upon geometrical patterns derived from the constellations. Thus, a temple might be planned according to the constellation of Pegasus or a court of judgment modeled after the constellation of the scales. The Dionysians evolve a peculiar code by which they were able to communicate with one another in the dark and both the symbols and the terminology of their guild were derived, in the main, from the elements of architecture. While stigmatized as pagans by reason of their philosophic principles, it is noteworthy that these Dionysiac craftsmen were almost universally employed in the erection of early Christian abbeys and cathedrals, whose stones even to this very day bear distinguishing marks and symbols cut into their surfaces by these illustrious builders. Among the ornate carvings upon the fronts of great churches of the Old World are frequently found representations of compasses, squares, rules, mallets, and clusters of builders' tools skillfully incorporated into mural decorations and even placed in the hands of the effigies of saints and prophets standing in exalted niches. A great mystery was contained in the ancient portals of the Cathedral of Notre Dame which were destroyed during the French Revolution, for among their carvings were numerous Rosicrucian and Masonic emblems. And according to the records preserved by alchemists who studied their bar-reliefs, the secret processes for metallic transmutation were set forth in their grotesque yet most significant figures. The checkerboard floor upon which the modern Freemasonic Lodge stands is the old tracing board of the Dionysiac architects, and while the modern organization is no longer limited to workmen's guilds it still preserves in its symbols the metaphysical doctrines of the ancient society of which it is presumably the outgrowth. The investigator of the origin of Freemasonic symbolism who desires to trace the development of the order through the ages will find a practical suggestion in the following statement of Charles W. Hakeithan but considering that Freemasonry is a tree the roots of which spread through so many soils, it follows that traces thereof must be found in its fruit. That its language and ritual should retain much of the various sects and institutions it has passed through before arriving at their present state, and in Masonry we meet with Indian. Egyptian, Jewish, and Christian ideas, terms there from the supreme ambition of their craft and symbols. See the secret societies of all ages and countries. The Roman Collegia of skilled architects were apparently a subdivision of the greater Ionian body, their principles and organization being practically identical with the older Ionian institution. It has been suspected that the Dionysians also profoundly influenced early Islamic culture, for part of their symbolism found its way into the mysteries of the Dervishes. At one time the Dionysians referred to themselves as sons of Solomon, and one of the most important of their symbols was the seal of Solomon, two interlaced triangles. This motif is frequently seen in conspicuous parts of Mohammedan mosques. The Knights Templars, who are suspected of anything and everything, are believed to have contacted these Dionysiac artificers and to have introduced many of their symbols and doctrines into medieval Europe. But Freemasonry most of all owes to the Dionysiac cult the great mass of its symbols and rituals which are related to the science of architecture. From these ancient and illustrious artisans it also received the legacy of the unfinished temple of civilization that vast, invisible structure upon which these initiated builders have labored continuously since the inception of their fraternity. This mighty edifice, which has fallen and been rebuilt time after time but whose foundations remain unmoved, is the true everlasting house of which the temple on the brow of Mount Moriah was but an impermanent symbol. Aside from the operative aspect of their order, the Dionysiac architects had a speculative philosophic code. Human society they considered as a rough and untrue ashlar but lately chiseled from the quarry of elemental nature. This crude block was the true object upon which these skilled craftsmen labored, 
polishing it, squaring it, and with the aid of fine carvings transforming it into a miracle of beauty. While mystics released their souls from the bondage of matter by meditation and philosophers found their keenest joy in the profundities of thought, these master workmen achieved liberation from the wheel of life and death by learning to swing their hammers with the same rhythm that moves the swirling forces of cosmos. They venerated the deity under the guise of a great architect and master craftsman who was ever gouging rough ashlars from the fields of space and truing them into universes. The Dionysians affirmed constructiveness to be the supreme expression of the soul, and attuning themselves with the ever-visible constructive natural processes going on around them, believed immortality could be achieved by thus becoming a part of the creative agencies of nature. Solomon, the Personification of Universal Wisdom The name Solomon may be divided into three syllables, Solom on, symbolizing light, glory and truth collectively and respectively. The Temple of Solomon is, therefore, first of all the house of everlasting light, its earthly symbol being the Temple of Stone on the brow of Mount Moriah. According to the mystery teachings, there are three temples of Solomon, as there are three grand masters, three witnesses, and three tabernacles of the Transfiguration. The first temple is the grand house of the universe, in the midst of which sits the sun soul upon his golden throne. The twelve signs of the zodiac as fellow craftsmen gather around their shining lord. Three lights, the stellar, the solar, and the lunar, illuminate this cosmic temple. Accompanied by his retinue of planets, moons, and asteroids, this divine King Solomon, whose glory no earthly monarch shall ever equal passes in stately pomp down the avenues of space. Whereas Chirim represents the active physical light of the sun, Solomon signifies its invisible but all-powerful, spiritual and intellectual effulgency. The second symbolic temple is the human body the little house made in the image of the great universal house. Know ye not, asked the Apostle Paul, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Freemasonry within a temple of stone cannot be other than speculative, but Freemasonry within the living temple of the body is operative. The third symbolic temple is the Sular House, an invisible structure, the comprehension of which is a supreme Freemasonic arcanum. The mystery of this intangible edifice is concealed under the allegory of the Soma Suclicon, or wedding garment described by St. Paul, the robes of glory of the High Priest of Israel, the yellow robe of the Buddhist monk, and the robe of blue and gold to which Albert Pike refers in his symbolism. The soul, constructed from an invisible fiery substance, a flaming golden metal, is cast by the master workman, Chiram Abif, into the mold of clay the physical body and is called the Molten Sea. The temple of the human soul is built by three master masons personifying wisdom, love, and service, and when constructed according to the law of life the Spirit of God dwells in the holy place thereof. The Sular Temple is the true everlasting house, and he who can raise or cast it is a master mason indeed. The best informed Masonic writers have realized that Solomon's Temple is a representation in miniature of the Universal Temple. Concerning this point, A. E. Waite, in a new encyclopedia of Freemasonry, writes it is macrocosmic in character, so that the Temple is a symbol of the universe, a type of manifestation itself. Solomon the spirit of universal illumination, mental, spiritual, moral, and physical, is personified in the king of an earthly nation. While a great ruler by that name may have built a temple, he who considers the story solely from its historical angle will never clear away the rubbish that covers the secret vaults. The rubbish is interpolated matter in the form of superficial symbols, allegories, and degrees which have no legitimate part in the original Freemasonic mysteries. Concerning the loss of the true esoteric key to Masonic secrets, Albert Pike writes no one journeys now from the high place of Kabeo to the threshing floor of Oman the Ebusite, nor has seen, his master, clothed in blue and gold. Nor are apprentices and fellow crafts any longer paid at their respective columns. Nor is the master's working tool the tracing board, nor does he use in his work chalk, charcoal, and an earthen vessel, nor does the apprentice, becoming a fellow craft, pass from the square to the compass. For the meanings of these phrases as symbols have long been lost. According to the ancient rabbins, 
Solomon was an initiate of the mystery schools and the temple which he built was actually a house of initiation containing a mass of